Some of you uh, may have heard my two prior um, presentations. The, the first one I did was sort of uh, on schizophrenia, but on a more, um, I would say, level of talking about communication and perspectives. And uh, the second talk I gave last year was much more sort of on algorithms of treatment. Um, and those of you who know me probably know that though I have slides and my I really like these talks to be interactive and this particular one I think is really conducive to that so um so Hidden Valley Road Inside the Mind of an American Family by Robert Polkler is a not only an interesting book in terms of from a psychiatric perspective but in my opinion it's also a very well written book and um, both from the telling of the story of the family, but also it weaves in, in many ways, the history of psychiatry and how um, it has evolved and suggests how it, it continues to evolve and what the future may have to hold. So um, before I get started on, on the slides and kind of try and jumpstart things a little bit. How many people have been able to read the book or have read the book? Uh, let me get to Gary. Okay. So a few. Okay. So I'm going to briefly just talk about sort of, of the bones of the book um, be, and then talk about what I think are the elements of the book that it um, um, it sort of highlights. So I'm going to try and share my screen at this point. Let's see if I can do that. Okay. Can people see my slides now? Yep, that's a yes. Yes. Good. Okay, cool. We're in business. So, um, what? Uh, so, this is the title of the book. If you have not had the opportunity to read it, I would highly suggest doing so. Like I said, I would divide the book into two parts, so they're very closely interwoven. One is the actual story of this family, uh, going back to the parents and even their. Uh, personal history, and then the family's history, all the way to the time of the parents' death. And it's a very well done research book. The family, the children cooperated with it. And um, the mother actually cooperated with it. She was alive while the book was being written. So, so there's a lot of, a lot of very insightful um, thoughts and comments from various perspectives of family members. Embedded in the book, there's this back and forth with what was going on with the treatment of schizophrenia during the course of this family's um, contact with, with treatment and all of the issues that, that anybody who has touched on mental health issues has come across. Oh, um, it, and like I said, it's woven very well together, and I think it just raises a lot of feelings and questions. It certainly did for me uh, about psychiatry, treatment, its evolution, and um, where are we today and where are we going? Um, so, um, so the basic facts about this family. Um, the father was born in Queens, New York in 1924. He died in 2003. Um, he was in the Air Force. He was a World War II veteran who, who served in the Pacific tier of the war and saw active combat. And it's pretty clear from um, what is described about him in that time that he did have PTSD. Um, and that's sort of one of the questions uh, about him. He, his entire career was either with the Air Force even after the war or a, sort of affiliated and around 
uh, that type of work. Um, the family um, was essentially born and raised in Colorado, and Colorado Springs, where the academy is, and their, their sort of roots are there. Um, mom was Mary Kenyon Blimey Galvin. She was born in Houston, Texas. Um, died in, she was born in 1924, also died in 2017. Um, she, her family background briefly was essentially, um, she was abandoned by her father. Um, at a very young age, the family uh, ran into some hard times, even though they were relatively uh, affluent family in Texas and moved to New York. And that's where um, the two of them met. So um, they proceeded to have 12 children. Um, of those 12 children, um, six of the 10 boys were diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, so, you know, that alone is sort of mind boggling. It, at least it is for me. First of all, to think of having 12 children. Um, secondly, to think, you know, of, I think anybody who has had one family member with a mental illness knows the impact that has on a family, but to have six family members, um, is, you know, practically unheard of. Um, so the, the six boys that were diagnosed were Donald James Bryan, who were the first three in line. Uh, and then there were two boys born, and then Joseph, Mark, Matt, and Peter, who were the last three boys, also had schizophrenia. So what you have is, you know, this, this group, and then you had Lindsay and Mary, uh, I'm sorry, Margaret and Mary. Mary changed her name to Lindsay uh, later. Um, and they were the only two girls in the family. So the, the chronology goes 12 children, three boys, then four boys, and three more boys. The first three and the last three boys were diagnosed with schizophrenia at various points in their life. And then you have two girls at the end, okay? Um, so um, that's kind of the, the roots of it. Um, from anybody else who's read the book, do before I go to the next slide, do they want to add anything about sort of the basic facts of the family that's particularly struck them or anything? Not right now. Okay, cool. Um, and we'll just move on. Um, the next slide. So <laughs> this is an incredibly long list. And the reason it's a long list is because I believe that this, their family story literally touches on every single one of these topics. And we only have an hour tonight. Um, literally, I think we could spend an hour on each of these topics in the context of mental illness and certainly within the context of schizophrenia. So once again, keep in mind, we're talking about a family of 12 children, two adult parents, and six members of that family being schizophrenic. What are the elements that I think this touches on? Well, of course, the most obvious one is genetics, right? How much do genetics come into play? But that's just skimming the surface because now versus when the first child was diagnosed, we know that genetics play a large part in schizophrenia. What we don't know is the exact nature of that genetic contribution. Genetics are very, very complicated, um, and it is not like a single gene or a single group of genes. And it may even be that there are multiple genetic combinations that either directly lead to schizophrenia or could make one vulnerable to and I'll get into that in a, in a little bit. 
Um, the causal complexity of schizophrenia, what do I mean by that? Which is, once again, is it, is it caused, and I'm going to put that in quotes, by genetics? Is it caused by genetics, but then environmental triggers? Is it by genetics and then um, stress, trauma, anxiety, you know, all of those factors uh, coming into play? Um, so that's that part. There are different clinical presentations, and I find this very, very interesting. So you would say, okay, here's one family, okay? So you would, you could simply hypothesize that in one family, six boys, all schizophrenic, would potentially have very similar clinical presentation, right? That is not the case in this family. And you will see that there is a wide range of six boys on how they presented, how some of them are more aggressive and more violent than others. Some were more subdued, some were quieter, some um, their presentation came out a little later in their lives. Um, so once again, why is that? This is, it is not all the same. Pharmacologic treatment pros and cons, once again, thinking back from the span of this, we're going back from a time where, you know, the only real treatment from a pharmacological standpoint was uh, Thorazine. And then, you know, there were, of course, um, ECT was used, cold baths, insulin shock, all those things we know now um, were not particularly effective. Um, to today, where we have um, many more types of medications available, but all of those medications also come with significant side effects and some, some you know, real pros and cons to them. Um, psychosocial treatment. Once again, going back to when this first family first presented, they were in the midst of the whole psychoanalytic sort of predominance of the field, you know, therapy, uh, the theories about um, schizophrenogenic mother, and, and that theory has been debunked. Please, moms, don't, don't take offense. That, that has been a debunked theory for a long time. Uh, but unfortunately, it was at the time. Um, and also other theories about levels of what's called expressed emotion within the context of a family. Um, nowadays, there are actually some really good psychosocial treatments um, that are available and especially being used for early intervention. Uh, in other words, if you've got a teenager, you suspect or somebody even younger, there, there are programs now trying psychosocial intervention at a very early age and seeing some success with that. So we've come a very long way from, from the beginning of, of psychosocial interventions to now in terms of theory and effectiveness. Diagnosis. Um, so this family was diagnosed as schizophrenic, all the children. However, they had the same experience that many, many people have um, is, you know, you'll go to one place early in the illness and the diagnosis will be bipolar disorder, um, or it will be schizoaffective disorder, or you then see another, go to another institution and the diagnosis changes. And, you know, that's very frustrating. Um, and, um, but it's also in some ways the nature of the illness because the illness evolves. What The way it presents in the beginning can change dramatically, especially if you see the early symptoms as a teenager or someone in their early 20s. I think all of us can relate to the idea that how we are as were as a teenager versus how we were in our 20s, 30s, and 40s can be very different. And that has an influence on the way the, the illness can present. Um, family dynamics. Um, another key factor, you have got two parents and 12 children. The age span within this family is profound. So, so 
the experience that Donald, the oldest son, had versus the experience that Lindsay had as the 12th child in a large family growing up with six older brothers who are schizophrenic is clearly not the same family dynamic, not the same life experience. And that's an important factor to remember. Um, this has the impact of other family members, uh, including but not limited to parents and siblings. And both these are in both ways. In other words, um, mom, when she had her first child and dad, um, had one kid or two kids. There wasn't a schizophrenic child in the family, but they have to be impacted by what they are dealing with and their own level of understanding and as they've gotten older and the stressors they are on. So this picture is amazingly complex in terms of this is not a photograph. There's no fixed point in time where anything is truly the same. So um, comorbid disorders, um, we see this a lot in um, schizophrenia, right? The comorbidity of alcoholism and substance abuse, especially in younger individuals who um, are attempting Sometimes they're attempting to self-medicate. Sometimes they're trying to make sense of a world that they can't even describe and we can't pick up yet as it's not fitting in the same way that um, someone who is not prone to a mental illness is. Um, and so, once again, this is, this is another complex factor, and it's not unusual to see alcohol and drugs playing a significant part in the course of someone's illness until at least they're in their mid-20s, late-20s, early-30s. And then, hopefully, a handle can uh, be achieved uh, on those issues, but unfortunately, not always. Uh, so... Um, suicide and homicide um, both occur in schizophrenia. Um, and unfortunately, in this particular family, uh, Brian, um, when he was in his early 20s, um, ended up uh, having a relationship with a woman. That relationship did not go well. Um, and unfortunately, it ended up in him. Um, killing her and then committing suicide. Um, and um, it was a very tragic. So this family has, has been through a lot. And that was obviously one of the most tragic manifestations of, of the illness. Um, legal and ethical issues. As you would suspect, um, especially the brothers who tended to be a little more violent, Donald and James, especially Donald, ran into all sorts of problems with law enforcement, with the judicial system, um, with um, that system being unable to either understand or truly uh, treat mental illness. And so they did get lost in that system frequently. Um, the ethical issues, um, and I'll go back to the checkered history of treatment, right? From going way back to uh, therapy treatments that were ineffect ineffective to medications to, is the medication making a, an individual's life better or worse based on their own personal experience of the impact of the medicine, the side effects, et cetera. Um, individual and generational trauma, um, I sort of alluded to that um, earlier in terms of talking about each individual and where they fit into the family order. And then lastly, institutional trauma. You know, as a, as a psychiatrist who spent his whole career dedicated to uh, the mentally ill, um, I wish I could say that the field um, was a lot... Um, didn't have quite of a checkered past as it has had. 
Um, and, you know, it, it's the nature of so much unknown in the field, and so much is changing in that regard. Now, because of the ability to look at the biochemistry, the neurobiology, the neuroanatomy, um, and I fully expect in the next 10, 20 years, you're going to see many, many more advances in these areas, which will lead, I hope and believe, to more effective treatment. Um, so. Um, is correlation does not imply causation. And we saw a lot of that happen, and we frequently see that happen um, in medicine in general. And the, you know, the schizophrenogenic psychoanalytic theory was a good example of correlation uh, trying to be used to imply cause. And there really was no causation involved in that. Um, I think one could understand if you are a parent with a schizophrenic child, that is going to have a huge impact on how you interact with that child, how you deal with that child, how you try and care for that child and protect them. Um, and so it's, it's not uh, a one-way street in terms of what happens in that dynamic. Um, so um, before I go on, would anybody like to make any comments or throw out some ideas or questions? Am I boring everybody? Oh, not, not at all, Frank. But I would <laughs> like to throw one thing out. And this is just one of the things I've really cared about across many different behavioral health areas. And that is, uh, you mentioned the family and the impact on the parents and the siblings of trying to care for somebody with a mental health di a mental illness diagnosis. Uh, and how are we making progress on being able to build care for the family into the overall treatment? Because one of the things that challenges me the most is we are a, a nation of families. We're not a nation of individuals. And each individual typically has a family caring for them in many cases, not all I know, but I just, I don't see our system recognizing the needs of the family members. And I wondered, have we made progress in that regard? Um, so I'm gonna give you an unsatisfying answer, I'm sure, um, yes and no. Um, Yes, there is a significant amount of common understanding and acknowledgement that families need to be involved with um, an entire treatment plan to get effective treatment, especially for the severely mentally ill. And you see this being emphasized in these early programs of detection and intervention, um, not only because you know the ages they're targeting are children and adolescents that are still living with their family, but the understanding of the impact that the child has on the family and the family has on the child and the patient. And unfortunately, many people, if they are ill to a certain degree, getting them to the point to be even semi-independent is a huge, huge challenge. And the burden of caring for them and trying to help them get there frequently falls to the family. So then I will get on to systemically, are there the resources available that should be to get families involved, keep them involved, and have staff, the number of staff in the system that that would take? And the answer to that is no. And I'm sure everybody on this call knows how poorly resourced and how poorly funded in general mental health is. Thank you, Frank. And any other comments or questions? They can be negative. I'm not thin skinned, so. No? Okay. So I have created here um, sort of a, a list of different topics that we could talk about um, tonight. 
Um, clearly, many of them we are not going to talk about <laughs> because we just don't have time. But, but this gives you, I think, an idea of where we are right now in the state of the art. And I'm just going to read through these because I've got a couple of graphs uh, later in my slides. And I do have a couple of references if you wanted to go to the original material articles also um, to see what I'm talking about. So um, aspects of schizophrenia we could discuss. Historical foundations, epidemiology, suicide risk, genome-wide association studies, twin studies, neuroimaging, ventricular size, complement component for mediated synapse elimination. I'm sure that's the first one everybody wants to talk about tonight. <laughs> um, then major histocompatibility complex markers, association seen in obstetrical complications, nutritional issues, prodromal and attenuated states, cannabis use, um, childhood trauma, immigration, traumatic brain injury, repressed emotions of caregivers, recidivism, conditions comorbid with obsessive compulsive disorder, mood disorders and substance use, legal issues and ethical issues. Every single one of these issues, this family um, has touched on, either in members of their family, or um, through their cooperation with participating in long-term NIH-funded genetic studies, which they did, which provided a, a tremendous amount of information. Um, so, um, you know, childhood trauma, just to give you one example, uh, unfortunately, um, the one of the... Um, Member, one of the older siblings did sexually abuse the younger children, the younger daughters, um, and the you know the parents didn't know about it. Um, you know, there's of course discussion back and forth amongst uh, the daughters' presentation, the parents, etc., whether that was true or not, and. At the time, the thought was since this particular individual was living independently and was married, that getting the girls out of the house was a way of creating somewhat of a safe haven for them. Unfortunately, that was not the case um, at all. Um, and later on, we do also find out that um, mom also had a history of sexual trauma, which she never revealed to anybody until very, very late in her life. Um, so once again, these layers upon layers of trauma, I referred to the PTSD that dad had. Um, he also, um, some of the boys, obviously in the course of their history and their illness, had significant trauma when it came to their contact with law enforcement. Um, and even among themselves, there was a very strong, intense rivalry between the two oldest brothers that frequently would become very violent and occur in the home, which traumatized the whole family. So um, once again, very complex situation, but, but something that raises all of these issues. Um, Frank, yeah. In terms of these topics, I think the one that I'm the two that I'm really interested in. One of them is just cannabis. We had a talk on cannabis, but how cannabis impacted the disease, and the other one is the traumatic brain injury and how that impacted the presentation in the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, cannabis. Um, the data is pretty clear when it comes to severe mental illness and psychotic disorders about the early use of cannabis. And by early use, I mean um, early, you know, preteen, teen years use of cannabis. There is a very high correlation of um, psychotic symptoms uh, occurring in vulnerable populations. Um, 
by the use of, of significant cannabis use. Now, one could say, well, what's significant? There, there aren't exact quantities. The issue nowadays is with the legalization of cannabis, um, cannabis now is very potent. If you get it from any of the, the dispensaries, now, when you get it on the street, it's still more potent than it was 30 or 40 years ago, but um, it still has more of an impact. It may have less of an impact than what you're getting in the dispensaries. Of course, when you buy something in the dispensary, the good news is you know exactly what you're getting. Um, and, you know, you generally aren't as concerned, well, you're not, as, you're not concerned with it being laced with other drugs, which is what of the issue with cannabis use. Um, as, gets, as the severely mentally ill get older, you will find individuals who say that the use of cannabis on a regular basis is therapeutic for them, that it does help them with their anxiety. Um, and um, we don't have any really good studies about that right now. So, you know, I can't tell an individual that they're wrong. I can only point out to them that for some individuals, it can have a negative effect. For other individuals, it may have a somewhat therapeutic effect. But I can, I as a psychiatrist have no data, therefore I can give them no guideline about that. Um, so. Then TBI? Uh, TBI. So um, the important thing I would say about TBI um, is to, is to, um, I'm sorry. I'm from Chicago. I know. Yeah. There we go. Sorry. Um, is frequently when we think of TBI, we, we think of it in a very narrow frame of mind. In other words, you think of it as someone who's been in a severe car accident or a motorcycle accident or had a fall, um, you know, something that produced a period of time where they were unconscious or had other associated injuries. The reality is, and we now know this from um, what we're seeing coming out of sports, especially out of football, where you can have traumatic brain injuries of, um, that are cumulative in effect. Um, so, you know, those head traumas that um, occur in some football players in high school, they never lose consciousness. You know, they seem to get up and are fine. They don't seem to be particularly disoriented. But if you keep doing that to your brain, where, you know, a concussion essentially is a bruised brain, where your brain is slamming up the side of your skull, um, if that happens repetitively, it can then cause changes to your brain, both on a neurochemical level as well as on an anatomical level. For some people, and this is where um, the gene... Uh, the genes come into play where what can trigger some of those uh, genetics that makes one vulnerable to, um, to a severe mental illness. Well, a TBI can be potentially one of those triggers. Now, that's not saying it's causative, okay? So it's not saying TBIs cause schizophrenia. It's saying that TBI can be a factor in conjunction with other factors that result then in the manifestation of the illness. Thank you. Uh, we had one other question in the chat, and that related to the prior slide and uh, suicide risk. If you could address that. There is an increased risk of suicide, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the percentage, but it's significant in individuals with um, severe mental illness. These individuals, there's a very clear period of time when they are more vulnerable to being suicidal. And these times make sense. Um, they are frequently the time when the person is beginning to truly 
feel like something is seriously wrong with them. Um, in other words, when they're beginning to get some insight into the fact they have a mental illness. Um, and therefore, it frequently can trigger a sense of hopelessness and depression about what that's going to mean for their life for the rest of their life. Um, and that can happen early on. It can also happen down the road where they've been through several medications. The medications haven't been particularly effective. Um, and they're becoming hopeless about um, what they can expect from life. There's another type of being suicidal, of course, is being suicidal based on delusional material. Uh, or being homicidal based on delusional material. That is actually less common than the uh, suicidality that occurs related to someone's insight into what's going on with them and their hopelessness. Thank you, Frank. Uh, we had another question in the chat about addressing uh, HIPAA and how it makes it difficult for families to be involved, to share info, and to talk with the medical care team. Yes, absolutely. Um, and and it is, you know, it is a frustrating topic, I'll tell you, from both sides, whether you're on the family side or whether you're on the clinician side. Um, so, you know, what what I and what many clinicians always try and do, though I know all of you can probably tell me examples of where I'm wrong about this, is from the moment I first meet with a patient, trying to get permission from them to speak to the family right off the bat or whoever they're living with. Um, sometimes I'm successful. And also there's the dynamic where, you know, one week they give me permission and then they get mad at me or they get mad at the family and then they retract permission. And, you know, so it is, it is a very fine line to walk. But what I, what I try and do, like I said, is continue to try and get that permission early on. And once I get it, if they retract it, I work very hard at getting them to give it back to me, um, especially, like I said, when the family is so involved in their care. Thank you. Uh, and then the next one we had was in a layperson's term. Can you explain the complement component for medicated synapse elimination? Um, I, I can they clear? I'm not sure what the term medicated synapse mediated excuse me um, okay say it again please <laughs> it's like number eight on your chart that's up right now yeah right there uh, where am i oh here complement component for mediated sim uh, okay so it's a complex theory given <laughs> given what it says right and it's really early on in development and what this is doing is saying there are different components to a synapse. You know, the way we, we are kind of explained it, it's like, oh, there's one neuron and this neuron has, um, you know, these number of receptors and, it, and they connect with another neuron, right? Well, what we realize is each, each part of that synapse not only has multiple different kinds of receptors, some are inhibitory, some are excitatory, um, and they are also influenced by other neuronal, neuronal synapses coming into that same junction. So you've, you've got this multiplication factor and component factor where you could have one neuron that essentially, by virtue of what, what receptors it has, is inactivating or, quote unquote, eliminating the ability of another synapse to function. Um, and why that is and under what conditions, once again, that's a question that's actively going on for research right now. Thank you. I think that's what we have for questions right now. Do you want to go ahead and move on? Sure. With the material you've got? So there are Every, does every everybody will have access to these slides, won't they? Or uh, can yeah, Jess, we'll get those posted, won't we? Okay. Yes. 
So the next two are really the, the references for the original articles. If anybody is really interested in reading the original um, article from the primary source, I know you'll probably just be running out to get these immediately. But <laughs> um, if you want to, you can. What's more important, and as far as I think, and more interesting is this graph I've just put up from one. So um, A is the developmental course of brain maturation. So what you can see here is what parts of the brain are developing during what periods of time, okay? And this is significant because We lost you, Frank. You can see them early. Can you hear me now? Oops. Yeah, you came back. Okay. Oh, good. Um, because what's important is when do we see symptoms of, for example, schizophrenia manifest? Sometimes you see it early on, you know, in the preteens, but it's far more common to see it happening 16, 17, late teens, early 20s, right in here, right? So what does this say? Well, it says that, is there something that's going on in these parts of the brain that are coming to maturation at that point in time that is, that is significant in whether it's on a neurochemical basis or on a transmitter basis or on a developmental basis, psychological basis, probably all of these things come into play. Um, so this tells you where some of that neuroanatomical research is now looking at. The other interesting thing is the graph below it, right? Where this is the, the ages where psychiatric disorders commonly first present themselves, right? So um, here's down way below here, the yellow is schizophrenia, right? Once again, looking at the age range where it presents, it's interesting for a couple of things because, once again, looking up here on the, the A graph or the gray chart, um, what, what parts of the brain are developing, but also look at what comorbidly is happening at the same time that you're beginning to see the development of schizophrenia, right? Early on, you're seeing anxiety disorders. You see substance abuse kicking in in preteens, and you see mood disorders happening a little bit later. Now, there could be several factors for that in terms of comorbid disorders, in terms of the emergence of the schizophrenic symptoms, not to the point where they are diagnosable, but certainly where the individual is experiencing them in certain ways, causing increased anxiety or manifesting first as increased anxiety. Or they're starting to use substances as a way of trying to deal with the world or what they're experiencing. And then, of course, as they begin to have some insight into their illness, of course, depression, right? It, which would make very much sense. So, when we talk about where the research is, this is this is a really simplistic way of saying, here's where the neuroanatomy is looking at, but they're also looking at the neurochemistry and the development of um, neurotransmitters. And then what about um, just normal developmental development? Teenagers tend to be impulsive and they tend to, to be pretty reactive. That's because their prefrontal cortex is nowhere near what it needs to be. And that's why you see a lot of the behaviors you see in teenagers. It's, mm -hmm. you know, they're still developing. Well, you see that in normal teenagers, but what about in someone who may be prodromal in terms of a severe mental illness? So, um, once again, there there's these components. Any questions or thoughts about this? Yeah, Frank, we've got a few questions, not so much mm -hmm. about this, although if anybody has a question about this, we should take it now. But seeing none, let me pass the other two questions on to you. Uh, 
Is there any correlation found in recent research with the development of the brain stem in fetal and early development and the onset of schizophrenia? Um, by no, fetal, certainly not. Um, as as you probably, as mo most people probably know, research on at the fetal level is very difficult to do. It's very controversial, nearly impossible. Um, and so, as far as I know, there is no research done at that level. There are, is some research done, um, and this kind of overlaps with some of the research. Frank, we lost you again. Hello? Yeah, you're back now. Okay. Um, please don't confuse aut that I'm saying that autism spectrum disorder is the same as schizophrenia. It's not. They're, they're different illnesses. But having said that, of course, sometimes what the research shows in one area can be used or prompts research in another area. And um, so you're getting some early childhood studies especially about early reactions to stimuli. And in this book, there was some early studies being done with um, the family's reaction to stimuli and how the members of the family, and it's not 100%, but those who were um, schizophrenic could not filter the stimuli like people who were not schizophrenic. And there's a range. Now, it's it's not diagnostic, but once again, if you think about the overwhelming nature of the world to many schizophrenics in terms of being able to process things, especially if they're having hearing voices and seeing things, and um, it once again gives you some insight into what might be a correlative effect. So there's some very good early childhood work that's being done in that regard. Um, so I, that's the best I think I can do with that. Okay. And we had one other question, and that is, could you discuss the drug Captyla, C-A-P-T-Y-L-A? Um, you know, I, I can only say it came out only recently. Um, and because of that, and because I retired on June 4th, I don't have a lot of personal experience with it. Um you know, it is, um, the studies say that it is far more beneficial than any of the others with negative symptoms, and that it also may be not as effective as clozapine, but may begin to be approaching it. Now, I, I always put the caveat on, when a drug first comes out, you always hear all these great, wonderful things about it. I always say, give it about a year and um, see what the um, what it looks like in the real world. Because what the way drugs perform in studies and the way they perform in real world under real world conditions are very different. So um, what I'd say is ask your um, psychiatrists about it and you know, how much have they used it? What have they seen? What is their actual boots on the ground experience? Thank you. Okay, I think we can move back to your last chart or so there. Okay, so uh, once again, um, so getting back to some of the questions earlier, here's an article on early detection and preventive intervention in schizophrenia. Um, I think if you're interested in this sort of information, this is a great article uh, to read. So, and here's one of the charts um, from that article. Um, so there are stages of, uh, schizophrenia, um, is so pre-morbid where there are no or few symptoms, um, prodrome where there's attenuated symptoms. So these are the phases where remember in this chart here, where we're talking about anxiety happening or maybe early drug use frequently. It may be in this no or few symptoms or attenuated symptoms. 
Um, and you wouldn't make the diagnosis based on what these, what these individuals are experiencing of schizophrenia at this point in time. Frequently, you only realize it retrospectively because they look like anxiety disorders or they look like, or they look like normal teenage experimentation with alcohol or drugs. Um, and however, it can then, uh, the illness progress to actual psychotic you know? And sometimes those anxiety symptoms, those substance abuse problems, of course, come in to here, right? And, to, and the deterioration, and then ultimately, um, um, psychotic symptoms, negative symptoms, cognitive symptoms, and functional disability, the, the more advanced stages of illness. So the gray part is the early intervention programs and that are trying to be developed that have shown some great promise. And once again, this is separate, related to, but separate from the medication. You know, it's not just, oh, start the medicine early, really early. It is doing therapy and specific types of therapy very early on. If you can, if the, if we can figure out how to distinguish some of these attenuated symptoms from an anxiety disorder to are they a prodromal symptom? Is there a biological marker difference? Is there a neurochemical difference? Is there a blood test we can develop? Is there a screening tool that can draw out a different nature or characteristic of that? But we can start that sort of intervention really early on and therefore hopefully change this curve back here. May not be able to eliminate, but wouldn't it be great if it never got, you know, below this, this really high level, and especially in conjunction with better medications, more effective medications with fewer, you know, that's the goal. Uh -oh. Any questions? Um, I always like it better when I have people in the room. <laughs> so. Well, yes, absolutely. It, uh, <laughs> lets us, uh, I guess I would have a general question, and that is just going across all this material, and you just mentioned the early intervention, but where would, you know, if you controlled all the research dollars and uh, whatnot, where would you put the emphasis on, uh, you know, how to advance the, the treatment and the management of this illness? Um, so I probably, and this, this might sound a little um, being a heretic coming from a psychiatrist, but I would probably split my money 50-50 with um, psychosocial, psychological interventions and biological research, and the biological research being further elaboration on the genetics and the uh, neurochemistry of um, the illness. But, but I would split my money evenly uh, because I think both parts are equally important. And I think if you don't have both parts, you're not gonna get your optimal outcomes. Excellent. Let's see. We got a couple questions coming up now. Uh, what does a person's behavior look like with early intervention? Um, so with early intervention, um, frequently you see, and so I'm going to talk about like few symptoms or attenuated symptoms, right? Um, you will see individuals, and it always is in a kind of a gray area. So how many kids, preteens, teens love to get into video games, right? And how many of them you think, oh my God, they're playing video games too, and they're like obsessed with video games. And if you're their parent or a family member, you're, you, it drives you crazy, right? But there's also a subpopulation 
where they take it to a whole different level, right? They, they can almost never be away from it. Their only social interaction can be through those characters on the video games. They um, are loners at school or have a very difficult time interacting socially. Their social skills, um, they're just not up to par with their age group. But they get on these video games and it's like they can connect in this abstract sort of way. Now, does that mean they have schizophrenia? No, not necessarily. But that would be one of those things. We lost you, try- again, Frank. Uh, am I back? Tell me when I'm back. Yeah, you're Hello. back. Okay, so one of the things would be to target therapies that would focus on their social skill and social skill building and their ability to hone in on social cues and how do you respond socially appropriate, things like that, Um, you know, very, very early on before they start suffering the social consequences of being, quote unquote, you know, the odd kid. Right, which then takes on a life of its own. Um, Excellent. And we have another question. Uh, what is the overall lifespan of a person with this disease? Uh, and that may be hard to predict, but what what is your experience? So statistically, um, the um, lifespan of someone with a severe mental illness on average is at least 10 years less than someone without a severe mental illness. Um, frequently, people with severe mental illnesses die in their mid-50s uh, to late 50s. Um, and the, the reasons for that are a multitude of reasons. Um, you know, many of them lifestyle reasons, those lifestyle reasons also being uh, contributed to by the, you know, the unfortunate side effects that these medications that we give people have. And that's where that pro and con cost benefit ratio is, because though there are these horrible side effects, for many people, this allows them to live a life that is better than if they were unmedicated. And, um, you know, there are some people with a severe mental illness that can live their lives without medication, but it is, it is a minority of people. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's see. And one more question. Many people can't uh, see their own illness. Why is that the case? Yeah. So um, I'm going to go back up to this slide, and I'm going to um, sort of use a very real-world example of if you've ever had a relationship with a teenager, whether it's a sibling, a younger sibling, whether it's a child, um, try and convince a teenager to uh, agree with something that they have no concept. They're they're invincible, right? If you tell them that is something dangerous to do or you cannot do that, they don't believe it. They don't think it. They see it as the, you know being exceptional. So part of it is is I believe hardwired into that developmental process. Um, also, remember by definition, hallucinations, delusions are real to these people. That is as real as you and I are sitting here on Zoom. You know, so you're trying to tell somebody who, like I said, it's real to them that, oh, that's not real, or or that belief you have that there's this microchip implanted in your head um, isn't there. A delusion is a false fixed belief. So frequently, there's a long process that it takes for people to get insight into they have an illness. And unfortunately, the only way it seems they begin to get that insight is when there are consequences 
from their illness. In other words, they are treated, they get better, they're doing fine, they decide they don't need the medication, they go off the medication, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you see that happen until at some point there's some recognition and they've gotten older and their perspective on life and, and the world changes it in themselves. They're like, oh yeah, um, you know, there there is something wrong. Now, I may not believe you or agree that it's schizophrenia, but I can agree that I need this medication, you know. But it's not uncommon for that not to happen until somebody's, you know, 30-ish, so. Yeah, excellent. Thank you.